minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Great minds podcast. Great minds think alike. Let's rock. You now tuned into the Great Minds. All right, welcome podcast. to the Great Minds podcast. This is Derek. This is Vaughn. And we're here with filmmaker Laron Lee. What's going on, brother? What's up, Good. fellas? How you doing, man? Chill, How are man. you? Appreciate, appreciate you. Yeah. You appreciate your time. Sure. Where, um, since we since we started this podcast, you were um, basically one of the first names that I I thought of um, doing big things, and you know it was just a matter of timing, and you know you know how I go everything else having on, but sure. um, but yeah, I want to um introduce uh Leron Lee, uh, a brother I've known you know probably close to 15, 16 years, maybe a little bit longer at this point. I uh, won't show our age too much, but um uh. Born and raised in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, went to the historic Arts High in Newark, New Jersey. Film writer, director, uh, multiple award winner, and um, a good brother. So we're just happy to, happy to have you here. Hey, man, I appreciate, appreciate you. you. <laughs> I, I, love, I love podcasts, man. I'm actually talking on this podcast mic I bought years ago and I never used. So now I get to, uh, <laughs> get to play with it a little bit. You know what I mean? All right, no let's doubt. go. All right, Lawrence, so I gave you the brief intro. Why don't you uh, tap into your background a little bit for people that may not know you? Um, well, you know, I, I think for the last 20 years, people have known me as a filmmaker of some sort, of some degree. Um, but I, my background is a mixed bag. Um, I started off, like, growing up, always, like, doing cartoons. So I was a cartoonist, and then I fell in love with acting, and then I fell in love with film and the film was the thing that stuck, you know? Um, so yeah, so uh, I was an actor and I, I actually went to school for it at Howard University. And um, when I was there, it was like, I don't want to sing and I don't want to dance, you know? It, it was like another level. It's cool when you, you, you're playing a line in the school play at the sixth grade, but, <laughs> <laughs> but when, you, when you go to college, man, it's just like, they just take it to another level I wasn't ready for, you know? And I was just like, maybe that's not the thing. I still have a love for it. I still have a love for theater. But when I found myself behind the camera, I said, you know what, this is cool. And I was happy to have that experience as an actor because now I know how to work with actors and know how to talk to actors and things like that. And um, it's just something that stuck. Um, yeah, so ever since, you know, I've been working on, you know, films and of course it started from the ground up. It was tough in the beginning because um, I just, it was, it was just, you know, I think when I started, it was all about getting on, right? It wasn't all about like, you know, having a good idea and, and getting it done yourself because it was just a different game. You could have done it, but it was a lot tougher back then. And then over the years, you know, film became digital. So which mean, which meant it became cheaper. So we were able to buy our own, you know, equipment and just get out there and do things ourselves. And over the years, you know, it's worked out. I've worked on um, various sets. I started out like assisting in the editing room for Spike. And, um, you know, worked my way up and made my connections. And um, one day just had the courage to say, you know what, I want to direct. And I never looked back. And no yeah. Definitely, definitely. I was going to ask about your, about your upbringing um, in regards to just, just growing up in Newark and what kind of, what made you go to the arts pretty much? Was like a family member, was family on it or friends or, you know, what made you? Go that way. Yeah, I think I was born an artist. You know what I mean? It was like one of those things that you couldn't um you couldn't help. And it's 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 like um, you know, we don't talk about that enough. Art being an artist is like one of those things your parents are like really scared, you know, <laughs> for you to go through. You know what I'm saying? It's like, you know, I went to St. Benedict's and I was begging my mother to go to arts and she was just like, I don't you know, you know, she tried, you know, she tried to fight it. But at the very same time, I was resilient even back then and just knowing who you are. You know what I mean? And I think I was just like, there's nothing, there's nothing else that I want to do. And I was very clear on that. So um, growing up was just like sports. You try, you know, to throw you in different sports, trying to figure out, you know, what you're good at and everything. And everything always came back to art. You know, I would sit in these basketball practices drawing everybody <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> so everybody would say yo draw, draw me this draw me that you know what I mean I was just 
that was about, that was my first talent. You know what I mean? Just being the visual. I knew I had an eye for something. I knew how to paint things exactly as they were. You know what I mean? And it wasn't anything that I had to practice. It was just one of those things that just came to me. Naturally. You know? Yeah, you start off, you know, you watch The Simpsons, you start drawing them. And then, like, you know, you, you kind of get the sensibility of what you're good at when everybody around you is, like, super Feeling impressed. It. Right. Yeah, like super that. impressed. And they're like, man, I can't do that. So I knew, you know, I had something. But um, I think when it came to acting, I, you know, people used to just throw me in things. And when I threw, and my mother, I don't know. My mother always thought I was good at everything. And um, she, was, she was wrong at a couple of things, but she, you know, she would throw me in it anyway. And we also know how the arts kind of save you from, you know, trouble. Right. Even yep. out of trouble. You Art, know what I mean? Arts and sports, for sure. Yeah. So I think uh, when you have parents, you know, a lot of us have, you know, black parents that had to put in the extra hours. And instead of just being home all the time and, you know, what Idle Time does, you know, they just threw me in different things and some of it stuck. And one right. of the things that stuck was art, swimming, theater, and being, you know, being there every day. And um, so, yeah, so I was going to acting down at the North Community School of the Arts and uh, learning drums at the North okay. Community School of Arts. And that was just kind of like my babysitter. So the arts raised me. And so it was no wonder by the time I got to a certain age, you know, I was like, you know, I was at St. Benedict's and I was just like, hey, you gotta, you gotta get me out of here. You know what I mean? Let me go down the street to arts. Yeah, let me go down the street. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's been love ever since. And it was just like, you know, to this day, that, those were like those years that are just like super prominent in my life. You know what I mean? Yes. And, um, yeah. So that's, that's just who I am. And, and you honestly are born one, you know, and, um, right. and still to this day, just fighting to remain one. Right. You know? And um, that's just what it is. All right, yeah. so like I, I like a lot of people don't like if you didn't grow up in Newark, like they not they're not familiar with Art High and how much talent actually came out of that. I'm talking about, I mean, you, most recently I would say Michael B. Jordan. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I could be missing people, and I know my cousin. You know, she's in her her fifties now. Went to school. She graduated with Tisha Campbell. You know what I'm saying? So like, and then everybody in between, like the they got you, you got Vertical Jones, you got Ladoon. Uh, doing his thing, half yeah. you know, all, all the all of my people's there, and just a lot of people that I'm not even I either don't know or um, I can't think of right now. Um, so how how was your transition from Benedict's, where like you were probably like the best at drawing things, and then you get the arts, and it's like, yo, he's nice too, and like how did that how did that inspire you, if any? You know what, arts is like the epitome of of stepping your game up, right? If you, you might think you're nice at something. <laughs> that's what, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> you might think you're nice at something. And then you surround yourself with people that also live that life. And you realize, oh, you were, you were entertaining babies. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Like you, you, you know, you jump in front of a kid and they're like, they're impressed. You're like, oh yeah. You know what I mean? And then you, you try to jump in the NBA and they're like, Get that shit out of here. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was the that was the response, you know what I mean? When you get the arts and it's just like you get to meet your people when you get to be surrounded by it and you grow, you know what I mean? And when you're surrounded by it, you gotta do it. But um, you know, I also found other loves there though, you know what I mean? So I was, you know, drawing nice cartoons and this guy was like drawing the hulk. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, just like putting 18 muscles in this arm and it looks <laughs> accurate. And, and it's like, you, you know, just mind blowing stuff. And um, I don't know. I just I still love it. You know what I mean? I still love, you know, the way it made me feel. So I to this day, like when I see, um, you know, animation, I just have a love for it. Um, you know, I, it's yeah. something I don't do anymore. Unfortunately, I just don't have the time. My focus is different. But um you know, I dabble in the doodles every now and again. Right. Yeah. Definitely. It's funny you say about arts, because I always talk, and I brought up on the podcast before that, I look at arts as like the Jersey version of LaGuardia. That's pretty much yeah. where it is, you know what I'm saying, yeah. as far as as far as it's concerned, as far as how many people come out of that school, go on to be successful in different areas. Art, and arts was first. Arts is the oldest art school in America. Okay. Wow. Um, yeah, so arts was first. And um, it's just that, like, you know, that's a little known fact, but, you know, I don't know how, I'm not very good at naming all of the names of the greats that come out of that, but it's just so much more, you know what I mean? 
Definitely, definitely. So I was going to ask you about your transition to, to college. So what made you pick Howard? For all the wrong reasons, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I went to Howard on a, uh, on a, on a, um, a black college tour. And out of all the schools I went to, you know, Howard, and I saw like Mike Geronimo standing on campus. Wow. You know what I mean? Just like, just stand. I'm just like, it was like mind blowing to me, like, you know, because, you know, we didn't see celebrities and things like that and people, but it was just like this mecca. And it was a feeling that I got when I got on campus when I said, yes, you know. Um, and I also, I think at that time, it was just like all the wrong reasons, but also knowing that, like, um, knowing what Howard was, you know what I mean? So it wasn't 100% all of the wrong reasons. It was just like, you know, we know uh, the weight that Howard pulls and how it, you know, how it holds. So um, by the time I got there, you know, I really got to really experience all of the things that Howard had to offer. And to this day, Howard is one of those uh, schools that just kind of like, um, to this day are still propelling me forward. You know what I mean? And you, and, and it's like a big fraternity or sorority. You run into people and you find out that they had the same experiences as you. And, you know, you click like that. And there's a lot of us out there, <laughs> you know? And um, you think RSI has a name. Howard University is a whole nother thing, you know? Right. And, yeah. Just like when I see Debbie Allen and Felicia Rashad, I'm like, I know, I know what company I'm in. You know? So yeah. So that's dope. That's I thought that's you dope. was about to tell us a Jesus Shuttlesworth story. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> nah. <laughs> he said, he, no, he said not, not like, no, nah, not like nah, that. Nah, nah, I'm playing. It, but, you know, but like, honestly, you know, you, you, you're making these decisions at 16 years old. Yeah. You know what I mean, not everybody has the right things in mind at 16 years old. I was an artist. That's all I cared about. Right. You know what I mean? So it was just like, I could go anywhere and do that. But like Howard, you know what I mean? I think a bit of it was a comfort zone for me, too, you know, being from Newark. Um, okay. And it's funny, people go for different purposes and for different reasons. And for me, it was just like, you know, I went to a black elementary school, went to a black, a predominantly black middle school, went to a black high school. So the black college was like, yeah, that's, you know, that's up my alley. That's right. Nice that's, what I've been, that's what I've been doing. <laughs> yeah. But my roommate was from, from Cali, and he was from the, um, from the Valley of Cali. He he was the only black guy in the school. See, he mm. probably, he probably, he probably wanted the experience you had the whole time. Oh, yeah. The whole time, exactly. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So he went to, he went to college. You know, he found his wife immediately. I'm sure he did. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? He was like, <laughs> yeah. So it right was just up. like, you know, there's a whole different experience when he got there, and um, you know, uh, and it's really funny to see him. Like, he's still there. You know what I mean? Still, <laughs> still in Maryland. You know, what he catch it. He catching up, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right up. that's what a lot of people do. So, um, you know, I'm like, damn, you left California for that. But uh, business <laughs> is completely different. Right. You know, got there, yeah. and 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 it fulfills people in that way, and that's always interesting. Right. No doubt. But we had a Mike Geronimo reference, so I'm good with that because people don't yeah. understand how nice Mike Geronimo was. Yeah. He, he was crazy. Right, he was right on that cusp right before. And then it just didn't pan out, and then you had the whole Murder Inc. popped off. But he was yeah, the yeah. first, but he was the first one out there. You know what I'm saying? So, so had nah, so on the album had DMX on the album. Yeah, it was exactly. on the album. It was time. Sure. It, it was all timing for him. Yeah, yeah just a little bit before well, his time. Right. But um, as a hip hop fan, you know, I'm six. I was 16. Oh yeah, like, yeah. Exactly. I gotta keep saying I was 16. You know, mm -hmm. and like you go to every campus and you see J Mike Geronimo, it's like <laughs> that's what it is. You know, that's what it sign, is. Sign me up. Yeah. Right, right. So, right, so what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, I wanted uh, to get into one of the, well, one of your films, Ugly, first. Um, so you had, the, uh, you had the one kid in there that kind of felt like he was trying to fit in. I remember watching it when it, when it first came out on HBO and everything. How'd you, uh, well, what were your thought process behind that one? And two, um, how'd you link with HBO? Um, I think that, um, Ugly was one of those stories where I kept finding myself liking movies like Juno. And yeah. I'm like, man, why? It's dope. <laughs> yeah, but it's just like, you know, black men, why do we keep falling in love with these stories and white teenagers and their experiences? You know what I yep. mean? Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, I think that it was a space that I felt that I needed to fulfill because I wasn't seeing that brand and genre in black films. And um, 
So Juno was just kind of the example and the jealousy that I felt to watching it. Cause I'm just like, man, this is a movie about a, a teenage, a pregnant teenager living in the suburbs. And I'm like, man, that would be a completely different story if she lived in my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't want to touch on something like teenage pregnancy because that's not my business. You know what I mean? Right. You know, I can speak on it, but at the very same time, when you're out, you're setting out making a film, you want it to be as authentic as possible. So what I wanted to do was draw from, you know, authentic experiences that I knew but still, you know, the same kind of characters that have the same kind of interests, but putting them in a different environment. And I'm often like looking at how we are portrayed on television and it's always a punchline, right? Norg is always a punchline. You're either at the airport or you're getting your car stolen. Or that's a fact. <laughs> so, so I was just like, you know what I mean? Let me just put uh, my hometown, my backdrop and represent, you know, the different kinds of people that live in this neighborhood. We have nerds too, you know? So let's, let's like, you know, put the nerd that lives in Newark on the front street and see, see the kind of experiences that he has and the challenges that he faces fitting into his own mold and his own neighborhood, you know what I mean? Yep. And, and those kind of things and, and those things that he has to do to fit in and how he trips over himself and everything that's wrong with relationships and just watching him stumble is humor in that, you know what I mean? Yep. Yep. So like, um, and I was also teaching at that time. So these are characters that I was in front of and, you know, outside of pulling from my own nostalgia, um, I got to see it over and over again about these kids struggling to just be themselves in an environment. You know, if you're from North, you know, everybody used to wear the same things. Oh. <laughs> Long you know, white tees, Omavis, the same brand. Girls. And after a while, you got to say, all right, that's, that's, I get it. Yeah. I had the same hair, but it's weird a little bit. <laughs> it's it's a little weird for us to be wearing the same thing all the time. You know what I mean? And it's just like we're we're super we're too too easily influenced by everything around us. You know what I mean? And um this was a kid that was basically struggling with his own individuality. We saw that he was a nerd, you know, but when the girl comes over, he wants to rip all of that off the walls to try to hide himself. You know what I right. mean? Right. So yeah, so that that was just a, a story of Real experiences. I love character stories. Um, I love seeing black people on film not not being killed. And um, I just think it's enough because I do, I do think that it feeds a part of us just to see us on screen being ourselves. You know, and right. that was that was an attempt for that. Definitely. HBO HBO was just a blessing. You know what I'm saying? Um, that was something that was like completely what I felt like it had potential for, but it's always a little unexpected, you know? Um, so you make this film, um, you spend your own money, you're super nervous about it because it's almost like uh, stripping in front of a crowd. You know what I mean? It's just <laughs> like, you're, you're, when you put your work out there, it's really, it's really like a nakedness to it. You know what Absolutely. I mean? Because you're letting people in on your mind and you're letting people in in this world and you don't know how people are going to receive it. And um, what ended up happening, we just submitted. It was just a simple, it was just a simple thing, man. We just submitted it to what was available out there. And thankfully they had black film festivals. <laughs> um, so when I started submitting it, the first thing we got back was Cannes. So I was mm -hmm. just like, yo, we got into, we got into a festival with Cannes, France. You know that big one over there? Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. We can't afford to go, but <laughs> we got in. You know what I mean? <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, so you know, I had to really get out of myself and you know start asking people for money, and I really had to get in that comfort zone. So people were supportive because they see that the train is moving. Right. You know what I mean? So the train was moving at that point. So we got to France, and I got an email, and it was just like, hey, we're HBO. How you, how's it going? Like HBO? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You already know. So um, right. you get that phone call. It was just like people that were like genuinely like a fan of the film. You know what I mean? And and that just told me that I was I was I was right to be fulfilling like the space, the space that wasn't filled within um, the film, the film industry. You know, we weren't seeing ourselves like that. And, I, and they just broke it down in a way. It was just like, um, you know, 
Don't get excited yet. You top 20. <laughs> you <laughs> you got to relax. Yeah, relax a little bit. But, um, you know, then you go through the rounds and you find out you top 10. And you got to send okay. it. You got to get to there. So um, it was that was one of those things that's just like it happened. And I always knew it could happen, but it happened. You know what I mean? And um, so we went to the Black Film, American Black Film Festival, ABFF. And was in a short film competition at HBO and got treated like a king. All of that hard work, all of that lost money. Um, it just it just turned out to be a thing that ended up being worth it. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No doubt. No doubt. It's funny that you said about the Juno thing, about, you know, the movies and stuff. I kind of subconsciously was thinking, like, I like a lot of, like, old high school movies. Even when I was younger, I liked, like, 10 Things I Hate About You. I it like... Is. I like yeah, kids. I like things like that. But I think the reason why I liked it is because it was some. It was a different lifestyle than I was used to. Than I was living a different perspective. You know what I'm saying? So I think when I saw Ugly, we all know a guy like that, a kid <laughs> like that. We know a kid like that growing up. Mm-hmm. And to see how he was like conflicted with everything and going back and forth, and and, and he had his friends, but he was kind of like, nah, nah, we ain't cool. We ain't saying hi no more. I'm saying hi to them when I'm, when I'm around her. You know what I'm saying? Like, but well, his friends was trying to pull him on, like, yo. Like, she ain't the one. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? But he's not listening. So the way it ended, right? Did you ever think about doing a part two of that? Uh, so the way that film came about is it was a feature film. And um, short films are a good way to prove yourself as a, like, a proof of concept. Okay. You know? <clears throat> so as a feature film, you know, I went to the producer, um, Derek Williams. Um, and Derek was somebody I've been just like working for for a couple of years, you know, throwing in here and there, jumping on his productions. So I went to him for advice with this script. And I said, look, I got this feature film and it's called Ugly. And he was like, fam, your money is funny. So, <laughs> so you know, I had I didn't really know the process of making a short film, but he, you know, he looked at it and he said, this is a short film, you know what I mean? So, and I had enough money just for that. <laughs> okay. you know, I didn't even have enough money just for that. You know, that's just like really what it is, is that you you work and people aren't getting paid their rates, but you know, <clears throat> thankfully enough, people have believed enough in the vision. Sometimes they don't, you know what I mean? Some people come to collect and they realize the vision was what it was a little bit later. Right. You know? But um, it was important that I knew the vision, you know, and um, I think that's what it is. And so now, you know, when I'm pitching Ugly as a feature film, I can say, hey, you know, here's the short version of it. This is the proof of concept. It was on HBO, yada, yada. And it gives it a better chance of getting made and, pe- and giving a better chance of getting investors and things of that nature. Right. Okay. No doubt. I wanted to um, talk talk about the, uh, the Catch a Girl joint. Like, yeah. It, again, if you're not in from our era or older, one, you don't even know that game. And yeah. um, everything was nostalgic about it. Um, Darius, when he was talking to the um, the girl at the... No, before he got to her house and his man was like, Is she, does she look like Tracy Spencer or Tracy Chapman? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, you, like, you had to be, like, in the era to know who Tracy Spencer was and even Tracy Chapman. And that's a big difference. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, yeah. From from like an immature kid's perspective, mm-hmm. uh, what made you want to put that out now? Um, see, it's always a story that is um, films take like two years to make. You know what I mean? So it was something I wrote a while ago, as a part of something else. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I just wrote it a while ago, and it was this concept that I had. I've always had it, but the conversation was uh, was starting to shift with predatory behavior. And then we kept losing our heroes. You know what I mean? And <clears throat> these are heroes that were just like, I can't watch the Cosby show, man. <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was, yeah, it was just, it was just like making me feel some kind of way. And um, every other day, and this is particularly 2016, where the Me Too movement was already created, but it was also, but it was like super prominent at that time. And then you just see people and men going down. And for me, the biggest question I asked myself was why? 
And it was just kind of like a light bulb went off when I started thinking, I started doing research, I started doing research on male gaze. What are the things, because it's not, it's, I don't, you know, some people are like men are born hunters. And I'm like, oh, I don't believe that. We're not like that animalistic. You know what I mean? I believe that a lot of it is learned behavior. So what are the things that help us learn this behavior? So I started going, you know, and researching and, you know, making, I made a whole presentation on it. Um, the movies that we used to watch, music we listened to, and this lifestyle that we were introduced to. And I realized that I had those things in my own childhood. And I started thinking about that game. And I started thinking about that game, how it affected gender roles. The women are always the prey. Right. And, I, and then the next thought was like, we never stop playing that game. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, it's just, they just play it differently, right? As grown men, the women are always the prey and the man is always the predator. And you hate to call it a predator. You know what I mean? But some people do take it there. And the game itself is sort of violent by nature. You know what I mean? It's kind of barbaric. It doesn't involve conversation. It doesn't involve, you know, get you getting to know the person. It just is like, I catch you, I get you. <laughs> I, I catch you, it's on, let's go. <laughs> yeah. very, very caveman style. <laughs> yeah. yeah, super, super caveman style. But a lot of like kids, that's their first interaction with the girl and the interaction with the woman. And I think about like, damn, who created that game? So I thought it was just something that you played in our neighborhoods, but you know, making the film, you know, opened up a lot of conversations. And I spoke to somebody that lived in Australia and they said they played that game. So this is something that was just like play click play played it across the entire globe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm. So like y'all were playing this in Australia, they were calling it something different. <laughs> I call it catch a girl, get a girl. And in Baltimore, hiding hide it, what's it what it called? Hiding go get it. Hide and go get it. it. That's how it works. No, you want to know the worst one? They said in New York they had something called booty tag. <laughs> That's a suspect. <laughs> yeah. well, booty tag. That's what they call it, man. Booty tag. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, so that was the that was the game. And um and I, I learned all these things after that. I said I thought it was just me, but no, this is just something that they played across the globe. And and what it does, man, it was a conversation to have um that also has a bit of a dark tone, but I also wanted to have this conversation with children. So you were right in saying children. You know, you had to be from our era to know that game because the kids now, they just don't go outside. Yeah, they play <laughs> video games or, you yeah. know, whatever. Or their phones or something. Yeah, yeah. so I, I felt bad for introducing them to that game. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, don't y'all go playing this game because you found out about it, you know, when, in, in making this film. But, um, but yeah, it was an important conversation to have and it, it just it was something that made them think and it was something that for universal audiences to take in and have that conversation for sure. Oh, yeah. So how important, um, Laurent, do you feel that it's for black men or black women to be behind the camera telling their stories, telling our stories? How important do you think that is to you? All right. So um, I want to say being from Newark, we already know, we already discuss how we're portrayed, right? <clears throat> I don't think anybody from Newark would ever, you know, make... I was watching... Sometimes it's, it's like being from Newark is like getting snuck everywhere you go. Like, <laughs> like I was just watching um, Death Becomes Her. I haven't seen that. So that was a, a classic movie. Bruce Willis. Um, was it uh, Meryl Streep and Meg Ryan? No, I don't want to get it wrong. Goldie Hawn. <clears throat> Goldie Hawn. Death Becomes Her. And you're just watching it and they're just having a conversation and they're talking about somebody and they just th casually throw in, I mean, she's from Newark for Christ's sakes. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> and it's like, you know, and it's like continuously like, come on. And I feel that, um, you know, black people have gone through that same demonization for years. You know what I mean? And um, it's really hard getting out of that. It's really hard getting out of that. And that's the most important thing. This is why, you know, when I, when I made Ugly, I was just like, you know, let me have him be a male character because I don't want to misspeak, right? 
I don't mm-hmm. want to speak. I also have, you know, a, a great team of people that I can bounce things off of. But I also wanted to make sure that when I'm telling the story, I'm telling it accurately, because the last person I want to be is to have a character on camera that doesn't give an accurate depiction of someone. Right. You know what I mean? So that's why I started there. And, um, and I do have, you know, female led films and written, but, you know, I just wanted to just kind of like, you know, walk my way in before I start, you know, jumping head first into it. Um, so what you're saying, I compare it to, you know, actors. You're an actor and you portray a very convincing villain in a movie. And it wins you Oscars and and everybody's praising you on how credible you are. And then you go out for your next job. What happens then? And you go out for the hero job. But the problem is you play such a convincing villain. <laughs> Can't get they lock like you nobody, in. Yeah, nobody sees you as Superman. You gotta right. play Lex Luger. And over and over again, because you played this one convincing villain everybody sees you as a villain. You know what I mean? And then you go to a coffee shop and you're not an actor. I'll just say you, you in particular, you go to a coffee shop and you see a guy standing there with a leather jacket and uh, black hair and he looks suspicious. And you're like, you know what? This guy looks like a villain. And, and it's like one of those things that the movies and power can create and um, give people ideas about who you are. And we need to pe- be the people that give you those ideas. Because when you right. aren't the people who giving those ideas, you have the wrong people speaking for you. Right. And you're creating ideas. And I, I hate that people are that influential. You know what I mean? But it's a real thing. People walk around, you know, and they see you and they think that you're this person that they see on TV. Hmm. And you think that you're this character that they see on TV because they saw it over and over and over again. Gotcha. And um, that's, that's pretty much the most, most important thing about like controlling the conversation. That's why I want to control the conversation. Or that's why black people need to control the conversation because if not, we're often demonized and film has power. Film has right. power. Film has power right. and how people see you all the time, all day. Um, so, so I see you linked with, well, at least for a picture op with um, Chadwick Boseman. Was that at MSG? No. So, uh, so Chadwick was a senior when I was a freshman at Howard. Yes. And so I did not know him. Um, but I did know, uh, people that he's close to his closest friends and, um, his producing partner, Logan Coles. And that was in LA. That was in LA. I happened to be going to LA called up Logan and I told him, let him know. Then he called me back and he said, you got a camera, right? (laughs) Yeah. So basically on the day Black Panther came out, I was filming Chadwick Boseman visit different locations. So riding around, filming him visit locations and um, went to a small uh, venue that night, partying and celebrated. And it was a lot of Howard people in the building and it was just love. And it was just a real, you know, it was like this biggest, it was like, wow, getting to see like, you know, you got this biggest movie in the world and just watching him embrace it in such a humble brag. It wasn't even a brag. It was just a humbleness. You know what I mean? Of like, uh, of, of intense and immense appreciation of what it is and people around, it was love. No phones were out. It was just, it was just a gorgeous thing. And um, yeah, so yeah, my and my question is because he he seemed like a he seemed like a guy that like you know you meet somebody and like it, I don't want to say he was like divine or something like that, but like I felt like he gave off tremendous energy. Like, how'd you feel like just Definitely. being in his presence? Um, like I feel like certain people have the ability to like. Make like like I would imagine a Michael Jordan and a whole somebody I like that. Felt, I think what it was, man. I just, I just, I think I just. Um, it was just like one of those moments in life where you just know somebody would give their left leg to be there. Yeah, that's where I'm at. I mean, <laughs> and um, 
it's like, and it's also one of those nights that you go back just feeling the energy beaming off, you know, Definitely. of that high. But um, I think that what, what energy that I got off was just inspiration from his focus. You know what I mean? They were already, ta already talking about the next day and, you know, what's going to happen the next day. It was a lot of stuff going on in LA at that time. That was, that was the, the release of Black Panther. That was the, the, um, the, LA All-Star Weekend. Uh -huh. And it was um it was like a film festival going on at that time. So it was just like a big three in LA and LA was a really busy weekend that weekend. And um that was just one of the things that occurred and um it was a real blessing. Um I've always heard stories but I never actually got a chance to be in the presence and meet them. And it was just like a moment that was good. And I got to show him some things that um, had inspired me. And um, just like a short conversation, of, you know, just like, you know, congratulating the guy. You know, it's just a big day for him. You know, was, yeah. <laughs> you know, everybody's just like, you know, um, just, <laughs> yeah. you know, just congrats. And it was just, it was just a real thing. It was just like one of the most inspirational things that you could ever be around. You know what I mean? And it also touches you to let you know, like, it's just all about the work, put in the work and, and be resilient and, and it's all possible. And that's just one of those moments that was, was just necessary. Right. For me. Yeah. You know what I mean? yeah. And I think the thing about, about Chadwick too, that everyone could kind of feel is that we saw the grind, you know what I'm saying? Like we didn't see the grind, we not actually did, but we saw him come up. We saw the movies and we saw, you know, the, the Jackie Robinson, you know, 42, we seen that and we saw James from Brown. now. James Brown. James Brown jump, but we were seeing it develop. You know what I'm saying? So we were seeing in the grind. And it's good for kids to see that too and everyone to see it. Yeah. But I, I was going to um, tag on something else too. Because so I know he was working on like, uh, I'm going to talk about actors and how you feel about certain things. So actors, um, he was doing EP and some things and um, maybe writing. I'm not, I'm not totally sure. But um, I was listening to an interview with Orlando Jones and um, he was kicked off. Uh, he, he was fired from a show. What's that show? Um... American God. The American guys. And he was going into really what was going on. So basically, and this fight goes on a lot, is that he wanted, he helped them write season one or season two. He actually had writer's credit, but they didn't want to give it to him. And he was acting on the show as well. So they promised to give him this credit. He didn't get it. He wanted to know for season two, I believe, he wanted to know his character's Bible. What was, what was the character coming from? Like, what was happening with my character? What's the development? They didn't write anything for that. He wrote it. Then they got, they fired him after he finished everything, right? So do you see a misrepresentation, especially when it comes to people of color, I would say, within the business where it's kind of hard for him, you know, he had to fight so hard to get, you know, his writer's credit and acting credit. They say it would give him too much money. But if it's another actor, I mean, we've seen some of the greats probably, Get, the, get those credits. Is it like a double standard that you see, that you see in Hollywood? Or you, have you heard of things like that? I mean, it's nonstop, man. It's nonstop. And I, it, it sucks because, you know, there's like two different perspectives. It's like when you wanted to become a filmmaker and when you actually become a filmmaker. Hmm. And, and um, or, or you just like, you just love movies and then you wanted to become a filmmaker. And loving movies is a completely different perspective than actually making them. You know what I mean? <laughs> and things get ugly. And things get ugly. You know what I mean? And especially for black black people and black women especially. Um, and um, it's a really unfortunate thing. It's a really unfortunate thing. And I don't really, I'm not really familiar with that story. I've heard, you know, bits and pieces. But it's, it's just one of those things that's just like... Um, he might have, you know, very well been right in, in, within his rights to just bounce and leave from not, you know, getting treated right. And I, and I think that's with anything, you know, anything yeah. in business because nothing comes easy, nothing comes without negotiation, and it's a really tough game. You know what I mean? And um, I do believe that Black people just have to fight harder and have to have a bigger machine behind them to do anything. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and it's not a, even a thing in film, it's just life. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> we, yeah, we had to, we needed like 50 million people on the streets mm. to say, hey, arrest one person. All right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And we're never available, you know, and thankfully quarantine 
uh, just helped us available, it helped us to be available to hit the streets. Exactly. You know, 50 million wide or probably more to say, hey, arrest one person. That's insane. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And then, and then, and, and it, but it moves the needle, but we can't be in the streets every day. Yeah, you, you know, gotta work sometimes. Yeah, I wish right. that we could. I wish <laughs> that we could. You know what I mean? Because I like us a lot better when we're able to to form and, and hit the streets. You know what I mean? But 50 million people hit the streets, and all we get back is is a Travis Scott meal. <laughs> you, know what I'm right up. Right up. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just uh-huh. like thanks. You know, thanks. <laughs> it's just like it took that many. You know what I mean? And, <laughs> Travis um, Scott meal. <laughs> yeah, so you know that's just uh, it, it's just like uh, a le- a big lesson in capitalism, and, and it's eye opener about our experiences. And you know, people are sacrificing their careers when they're when they're hitting the streets and definitely you know, hitting the front, and they're saying, "Hey, this is the truth, and this is what happens." And everybody definitely. makes them seem like they're crazy, you know, for saying anything. Right. But you know, I'm a big believer in taking back your power and speaking up. It is weird. It is weird being the only black person. Person you like, you know, and um, yeah. and you're hoping that your message gets through because it's a, I mean, we can't be surprised anymore. Look right. at our history. Yeah. Yeah. If we're surprised, yeah. it's our fault. Yeah. I always <laughs> think it's weird when you have like a white writer or anything writing for black black people. Not saying that it's weird. You can do it, but to not have many black say so <laughs> what you're saying in the room like in the room like you can't you know something could be like we don't talk like that we don't say that you need you need people to bounce things off because if i was a a writer and i'm writing for say an asian person <laughs> i'm gonna need somebody to bounce this stuff off of you know what i'm saying and it's, yeah. it's just crazy yeah. how, yeah. how people don't think that think that way uh, i wanted to ask you i know yeah, one of you i mean i should... how about so i know one of your yeah. your favorite films is boys in the hood <laughs> and and um, the crazy thing about Boys in the Hood, I guess you know it, it came out when we were maybe like nine, ten, something yeah, like I think, that. Yeah, I, I think nine, ten, yeah. Yeah, around nine, ten years old. And like at that time, like John Singleton was twenty three years old. Now, had we known his age then, we we're thinking at nine, ten. Well, he's twenty three. Of course, of course, he could write a, a movie, you know. But um, I, I, like looking back at like what he did at. 23 like boys in the hood is like a timeless film and just um do you appreciate what he did more when you like your age now as opposed to um when you initially watched it even watching it through high school or whatever yeah that film is still amazing yeah absolutely you know what i mean that film i don't know if people watch it but like to this day watch it you know what i mean like just sit Forget, you know, just let everything else go, turn everything else, like, watch it like you're watching a new movie. The movie is hardcore amazing, you know what I mean? And for him to be making a film, like, it's also very crafty, you know, it's all very crafty of a film. So it's not like just something that's like, oh, this is my first film and it's got, no, this is a film that's like, it's almost like it was made by a master, you know? At, at and, 23, um, it's crazy. Yeah, so that means that he started writing it. 19 Before. probably yeah. 20 19 like yeah yeah because okay. yeah, people say yeah you made this film when you're 23 no he was he was 20 yeah pretty much <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It, it, it came so out he, at 23 he, he, was, yeah exactly so this was this was a film that he was very young making and was saying it, it took bravery to make that film and he made audiences in france stand up right people with language barriers mm-hmm stand up and give it a standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. You know what I'm saying? That is a really big feat. And I think that, you know, I had to bring it back to John Singleton because I think I was taking that film for granted. And I think every now and again, it's just important to just say, you know, look at all these classic films. Let's watch it and remember why it's classic. Remember that feeling that you had out of the theater. I went to see that movie. I was probably too young. (laughs) I I, I, I I absolutely was. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But we were starving for black film. So, you know, what happens when we see black people on film, our parents are starving to go to the movie. So they said, you know, come along, let's watch this black film. Yeah. And we watched 25 people get killed. And then the sex scene, my mother covers my eyes. I'm like, <laughs> um, 
your, your priorities. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I also remember at a very young age, I was like, this, I'm watching something important and I'm seeing people that I know on screen. I'm seeing situations that I'm familiar with. And I know from a very young age that what we're watching is important. And those films are the films that last for a lifetime. Definitely. And those are the films that I'm mostly interested in because you don't want to watch a movie and that's it. You right. know, there's, for me, like, you know, I know people like don't like watching films over and over again, but I'm one of those people that likes to watch films, you know, more than once, especially when I'm, you know, enjoying it and I'm only hoping to make that kind of, you know, work. Right. Yeah. But the more you watch a film, you pick up things that you didn't pick up before. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So you see little certain things and so you start focusing on certain things, aspects of it. Like, yeah, but Boys in the Hood, every time it comes on, I watch it. You know, yeah. well, you know, same thing with Men's Society. I watch it. I watch the movies all the time yeah. because picking up different things and the storylines and what they're talking about. And I understand it so much more as an adult now than I deal with as a kid. You understood Absolutely. certain things. But once you, you know, you see what was going on with Trey, why he went to live with his father, why his mm -hmm. mom let him go, his mom let him go. And then he went, he didn't want to come back. And then and the back and forth with his mom trying to get him to come back. And he was like, no, I'm going to stay with dad. And mm -hmm. you see that in neighborhoods where, you know, I always think if you have a, a son, I think a son needs his dad, you know, and, and a, a, a girl needs, needs her mother, right? They just need their mother, right? It's certain things that, like, a woman can't teach a man and vice versa. It's right. certain things that can't happen. So I always say, if you have, if you're not with your child's mother, and it's a boy, she needs to let the father play an intricate role. And it should be a time where that boy goes with that father. You right. know, as long as the father's on the up and up, you know, everything's going good with him, to stay with him so he can teach him to be a man, you know? Yeah, so, uh, but so one, one of the things I loved about that character was that they, the parents still had a good relationship. Yes. Yep. You know what I'm saying? We like, you know, you know, uh, of course we have stereotypes and tropes that we see about, you know, black parents never being together or the father being absent. No, I love that film because it was one of the, what, not one of the first times, but maybe one of the first times where we see the black father, you know, and he wasn't absent. You know, these yeah. parents had a cordial relationship. She had an understanding. She fought it. You know what I mean? She, she didn't really want it to happen. You know what I mean? But you know, uh, she she tried the best that she could, and she said, you know, she gave in. Maybe, you know, maybe it is a good idea you stay with your father. Maybe he can be able to teach you things that I can't, you know. Yep. And that's just so, that's such a grown thing to write at, at such an <laughs> age, you know. I know, yeah. I know. Yeah. Especially if you haven't, if you probably haven't seen a lot of that. Yeah. <laughs> um, what else are you watching? Um, TV wise, outside of classic stuff, what are you tapping into? Um, so. Man, I think like we love Snowfall. I mean, if we want to piggyback, yeah. On, so on I just, yeah, I just caught up on Snowfall. Um, Amazing. I love Atlanta. Um, mm -hmm. You know, really loving Lovecraft right now. I think my favorite thing that I watched this year was the Morning Show. That was dope, uh, man. Yeah. That was. You saw love, that? I haven't seen it yet. I it, love it. it, it you talking about like the Me Too movement, and and, and I don't want to say too much in case you want to catch it, but like. It's like you look at Steve Carell in a certain way. Like you think about him from the office and he's doing like all this dry humor stuff. And he's doing a little bit of it on the morning show, but like his character is like dark. Like it's not what you expect um, Yo, from him. It was, a, it was a pace turner, man. It was a yeah. definite pace turner. I was just like, yeah, I, I, I really was into that show. And, like, and recent and, 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 and Reese is one of my favorite actresses too. Like she gets busy. And Reason Jennifer Dillon, yeah, yeah, she's dope. Now, but I look at I look at uh, Steve Carell similar to to Brian Cranston. Brian Cranston is one of my favorite actors because he can act in any he can do anything. He yeah. can act in whatever you want to see. So I think Steve Carell is in that same vein. He's getting in that same vein that he could do a lot of different hats. He showed it. He killed that. Yeah, yeah. I loved it. I loved it, man. So, how, how about music wise, man? What you listening to right now? Damn. In general, it could be anything. It could be something old. That's such a hard question, man. It's such a hard question because I change it up every day. That's cool. What you got? It's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's how it's supposed to be. So what am I listening to? I've been really liking like the rapidy rap albums. Okay. So I was listening to a lot of uh, Alfredo. 
Okay. Uh, Freddy. Freddy, Freddy. Freddy's that guy. A lot of uh, the allegory from Five Nine. Yep. Um, and just a lot of just just a mixture of R and B because like sometimes I just let Brent Fears like his his radio play or Brent Fears is dope. Yeah, so <laughs> listen to that, or I just let the K Tronada radio. Like it's like it's just a lot of stuff that I let because every day I wake up in a different mood and I different mood. Yeah, too. but yeah, what it is, life. I think what's really getting in t- me into like a creative mode is YouTube has a channel called Chilled Cow. And Chill Cow just plays lo-fi beats. So it's a lo-fi hip-hop beat. It's a stream. If you go there, it's a 24-hour stream. And I'm up every night to 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. Because it's just like a vibe and I'm able to work and the world is quiet. And those, you know, it just helps me think. I can't listen to music I love when I'm working, you know. <laughs> yeah. Because I'm too focused on I love music too much to listen right. to it when I'm working. But uh, Chill Cow has like those dope playlists. No doubt, okay. yeah. All right, got anything else for before we move to rapid fire? Man, we got a lot. Of, this has been a great interview, man. I'm learning a lot of different things, man. Just about yeah. the about about um. So I know I saw your your, your top movies, which I I love them. I, I love everything you stated, mm-hmm. was right on point. But what goes into a great movie for you? Like when you when you're watching the movie, what are you looking to see? Because I think the way you look at a movie is different than the way I would look at a movie. Work. You know what I'm saying? Because Definitely. of how my vision of what I'm looking for. You're seeing the intricacies of certain things that I'm not even peeping. So what, what are you actually looking for when you, when you do that? Wishing I made it. Uh, you ever, like, heard a song and wish you made it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the one with 10 million streams? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes I see a movie and I'm like, damn it, this is good. <laughs> um yeah. But um, you know, I watch movies on two on two tiers. I, I watch them. To, I watch it to enjoy it first, and 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 the second time I might be watching for the craft because if you're like paying too much attention to the craft, it's like you know it's an, it's, it's a distraction. You can't but enjoy the movie. Yeah, so I'm just watching movies and I'm just saying, man. And I think the biggest thing I remember is how it made me feel. Mm. Okay. You know what I mean, so it's it's kind of like one of those things where I love why the reasons why I love horror and the reason I became a filmmaker is like, yeah, I really remember how I felt when I watched that. Wow. I remember I watched The Wood and I walked out the theater like still happy and giddy. You know what I'm saying? Like it's just something yeah, that yeah. like you you really love and and it touches to experiences and you don't even have to have the experiences, but those films, those character stories that really take you through a ride, and it's not contrived. It's very real. It's unique. Look for uniqueness. In the films, unique stories. Um, I, I'm seeing uh, Boots Rally is making the film, making like a TV series about like a 70 foot kid. You know what I mean? And I'm like, <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like put me in these worlds, engulf me in these worlds. You know what I mean? That I'm not used to, or give me something different, give me something fresh. You know what I don't. Mean? So I, I think that's uh, the, the kind of things that I'm looking for when I okay. see. And I'm looking for us. I'm looking for us. Yeah, why? Well, right. no, no doubt. All right, Lamont, we're going to uh, transition to our, la- our last segment, which is our rapid fire segment. If you watch oh, yeah. the episodes, um, you know, uh, I'm kind of familiar with it. A lot of times it's open ended, um, and this, uh, this or that. Uh, we try to pull on things you love so you make a choice, um, yeah. make a tough decision. So, all right, so you, so you got an unlimited budget with a film, right? You, you get to pick your lead actor. Who are you going with? Unlimited budget. Unlimited budget. I mean, you could get you could get any actor you want. Um, really? Money's not a thing. Who you rocking with? I don't want even want to give it away. Um, unlimited budget. Damn. <laughs> Can I just say who I like right now? <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, boy. yeah. What you got? Um, so, so I'm really liking Brian Tyree Henry from Atlanta. Mm-hmm. My man, he's talking about the actor that, that plays Paperboy. Yeah, Paperboy. Oh, okay, paperboy, yeah, yeah, Paperboy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I don't. Yeah, I don't want to give the simple stuff. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to give the easy stuff because it's like, you know, if I say Denzel, I don't feel like I'm like really like. I'm just what? saying it because he's a great. You know what I mean? Like, do you really want that right now in 2020? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. it's just somebody that I really want to work with, and I see, and I'm just like, I. He's like in it. a lot of stuff too. Well, shout out to him. I think he's from Fayetteville, North Carolina, too. I got That's family true. down there, so. Okay. 
Yeah. All right. So uh, that's an interesting choice. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's that was the most honest thing I could tell you, man. That's nah, what I'm here I, for. I, I, <laughs> now I see I see what you're doing though. I I, I can see that though, cause dude dude can act. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Dope. So yeah, but it's so. also a fresh thing. You know what I mean? Like when I watch, I want to see fresh face. I don't. It's you know. You kind of stale. Yeah. It, it's real hard getting people to the movies <laughs> and sometimes <laughs> if you know what i mean you know uh, i yeah. remember i remember uh i had a friend a group of friends over and i said hey man i want to go see this movie flight who's mm-hmm. in it i'm just like fam trust uh, me. <laughs> uh, yeah exactly <laughs> i mean uh, i mean that's just the way the business works you know it gets it gets the butts in the chairs but like man I, I, I like work. I like seeing fresh faces, man. Gotcha. All right. No doubt. Many people like All right. I'm moving over to music. So, pick one. Freddie Gibbs or Royce of 5'9"? I go Royce. I go Royce. Royce. Landslide? Yeah, Freddie a little problematic sometimes, you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> Where? I'll go Royce, man. All right. What's your what's your favorite Spike Lee film? Hmm. Do the right thing. Do the right thing. All right. I say do the right thing. Fair enough. Yeah, you can't can't get mad at that. Yeah. All right. So if you could co-produce with either of these two people, all right, Martin Scorsese or Quentin Tarantino? Scorsese. Scorsese. <laughs> all right. All right. What's up? <laughs> Sorry to answer so quickly. <laughs> no, nah, I understand. I understand. <laughs> All right, so I knew you tapped in our unpopular opinion episode, so I want to tug on you here. Mm. What's the movie? And I'm not asking you to say the movie is bad or not. What's the movie that a lot of people like and think is dope, and you just like, eh, it's just all right for me? I don't know. I don't know. Or what's a movie that you thought thought was gonna be great and you were a little disappointed? I plead the fifth. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> fair, fair enough. Fair, fair enough. So so I, I mentioned this before. Ain't me. Like, no. <laughs> I mentioned this before, but I'll bring it up again. I like this question. So Parasukos or Jabot? <laughs> Parasuko, that was a more up north thing. There you go. More up All right. North. All right. So we're gonna um wrap up with Laron Lee, man. Pleasure, pleasure I having you, you on, bro. man. All right, man. I appreciate y'all. That was quick and painless and <laughs> yeah, man. Now you have some fun. It's a conversation. <laughs> That's it, man. You want to shout out uh social media or anything you got c- coming up? Uh, look at Mr. Lee on social media. I'm looking for dancers, man. I'm looking for some Jersey Club dancers for the next joint, man. I need some of that, some of that energy. I want to okay. uh, propel the culture a little bit, man. So yeah. don't get more lit than that. Yeah, for real. Man. Yeah, I love it. Love it. So yeah. Um, also, the New Archive. Um, people from Newark, if you have stories, it's a generation when your grandmama lived here, got pictures to share, stories to share, micro stories. New Archive is spelled like Newark I V E. And um, that's a, a, a new boutique archive that are putting together. And we want to tell some stories from there, man, and just make short films from real stories out of Newark's history. So um, something that's growing. And we just did a film series with the Newark Museum. So we're going to do another one. We got one more left. So, you know, stay tuned for that. So, no doubt. All right. You can catch the Great uh, Minds Podcast, YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, uh, Amazon, pretty much anywhere where um, you can listen or watch um, podcasts. You can follow us on Instagram at the Great Minds Podcast, on Twitter at the Great Minds P1. Uh, salute again to Appreciate um, LeBron you, Lee. Appreciate having you on, brother. Peace. Appreciate it. Peace, y'all. Great Minds Think Alike. Great Minds Podcast. Great Minds Think Alike. Great Minds Podcast. Great Minds Think Alike. Great Minds Podcast. Great Minds Think Alike. That's right. You're now tuned into the Great Minds Podcast. 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 Yeah, we can go on, oh boy, like him on a song. Culture's safe now, thank God. The panic is gone. Trying to heal from the pain. Take the pain and just all. Ain't gotta win. The stakes are high like a cannabis bone. Okay, it's game time. Picture with the balls. That's a face turn. Great Minds spreading faster than a rumor through the grapevine.
Vaughn and Derek, what? Deserve the merit, all saluted. Yeah. It's more than just a podcast show, it's like a movie. Vaughn and Derek, what up? Great minds think alike, it's the Great Minds Podcast. Great minds think alike, it's the Great Minds Podcast. Great minds think alike, it's the Great Minds Podcast. Great minds think alike, you You're now tuned into the Great Minds Podcast. You're now tuned into the Great Minds Podcast. You're now tuned into the Great Minds Podcast. You're now